Greetings, everyone. A uh, very good morning to those joining from the UK. A very good evening to those joining in from India. My name is Arman Mathur, and I'm a first year student, and I will be moderating the lecture for today. With that being said, on behalf of La Politique, I warmly welcome you to its annual flagship event, the Frank Thakur Das Memorial Lecture Series. This lecture is organized annually to commemorate the birth anniversary of Professor Frank Thakur Das, who is indeed a legend in the corridors of KMC. He was a workaholic Punjabi Christian. And he wore several hats here at KMC. He was an accomplished English teacher. He was the bedrock of our drama society, the players. Mr. Amitabh Bachchan himself was his first student who made huge strides as an actor. Later, Professor Thakur Das was responsible for shaping the careers of the likes of Shakti Kapoor, Satish Kaushik, Kulbhushan Kharbanda, huge names in the industry. He was a gem to, of course, our political science department, the Tisla Politique, because he was the author of books like German Political Idealism, Essays in Political Theory, Rousseau and the Concept of the General Will, The Pursuit of an Elusive Concept, and so on and so forth. And it hence gives us immense pleasure to commemorate him with the guests, who's the, the stature of whom we have been fortunate enough to have today. It is indeed an honor to welcome Lord Ranger, member of the House of Lords UK, and Madam Sharon Kaujandu, the director of the Yorkshire Asian Business Association, two individuals whose careers in their respective fields are an epitome of what determination, perseverance, and hard work can achieve. Values that were, in a sense, very germane to the philosophy of Professor Thakur Das's life. So before we formally commence the lecture, may I please request respected principal ma'am to address the occasion. Thank you very much, uh, Arman, for this very warm, energetic start of uh, this very, very significant lecture today. Uh, on behalf of Karodimal College, I am indeed proud to welcome our two distinguished guests today, Lord Ranger. Uh, Lord Ranger was nominated for life peerage and a seat in the House of Lords in Theresa May's designation honours. He was created Baron Ranger of Mayfair in the city of Westminster in 2019. Welcome, sir. We are indeed honored to have you here. Our eminent, second eminent guest, Ms. Sharon Kaur Jandu, is an experienced project manager and business delivery person. As uh, Arman already mentioned, she is uh, probably the felicitator and founder of several important international networks, which actually give expression to the need of the times. And uh, the fact that she was able to recognize this and create these institutions, it itself, something which is laudatory. And Madam, uh, we uh, admire your perseverance, hard work, and vision in establishing the Yorkshire Asian Business Association, Northern Asian Power Network, and Global Diversity Positive Action. The titles, the names of these institutions itself are a pretty strong indication of the sphere of uh, work. And uh, we hope the talk today, the discussion today, somewhere makes it possible for Kururimal College also to be able to play whatever role that is possible. And because our, uh, the center we have, Center for Innovation and Social Enterprise, which uh, uh, is actually led by Professor Rupinder, is something which looks towards such institutions and such pathways. So thank you very much, ma'am, for being among us. As far as uh, Dr. Frank Thakudas is concerned, Arman has already actually introduced him. And uh, uh, we have truly, the Kuro College has a strong legacy. And uh, the central main auditorium of college actually is named after him. It is called the uh, Frank Thakurdas Auditorium. As far as the theme today is concerned, we uh, do recognize that 
UK has a large Indian diaspora, which is almost 1.5 million strong. And the flair for entrepreneurship has seen Indian diaspora run businesses, making a very important contribution to the UK economy. And we have two examples here in front of us, whose talents and energy uh, in UK are actually felt beyond the world of business. And it touches individuals and societies, not just in UK, but even outside UK. There are several uh, fundamental values that are shared by the UK and India. And one of them, of course, is the bedrock of democracy. And uh, the fact of both countries being committed members of the Commonwealth. So there is a living bridge and living bridge is a symbol, a metaphor, which itself has become burning bright and living and active. And uh, this fact is going to be reinforced by the visit of uh, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and who, who will be here to probably plan for the next decade of UK-India relationship. Given this context, I think the conference today, the day today becomes extremely important for all of us. And therefore, all of us are looking forward to it. And uh, I congratulate uh, Professor Rupinder Oberoi, her whole team, all the students, all the staff members. I can see Dr. Rupak Datta was here, who have brought this together and made this possible. A very warm thank you to all the participants who are here. And I'm absolutely sure that we will go back rather enriched from today's discussion. Thank you once again for inviting me and thank you for your presence, everyone who's here. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your very, very kind words. Ma'am has not only given us an address, ma'am has also provided a contemporary hue to the theme which we've been provided with today, which we hope to, of course, build up upon in the lecture itself. Before again, we begin with the formal lecture, may I please very quickly call upon the, the staff advisor to La Politique, without whom this entire event would have been indispensable. Professor Rupinder Obroy, please address the occasion, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Principal Ma'am, and thank you, Arman. And good afternoon to everybody here in India, and uh, uh, good morning uh, to Lord Ranger and Sharon Jandu. Uh, thank you, Principal Ma'am, for your very kind words, and also supporting us through and through uh, whatever little endeavors that we try within the University of Delhi. Your support uh, has always allowed me to think uh, differently, to experiment, to be innovative, and establish these kind of partnerships uh, within the very academic settings, usually, which is the flavor of the university. So absolute pleasure to have you here, ma'am. And also, and uh, it's a privilege, rather, uh, to have Lord Ranger and Sharon together uh, to spare the time and be with us and uh, in a very, very busy schedule, which I do know of. And uh, I think, uh, as ma'am said, the timing and the theme of the lecture could not have been more appropriate because, uh, as we are all well aware, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is visiting India tomorrow for two days visit, which further sort of fortifies and develops the long standing partnership between India and UK. And the core agenda of this visit is, of course, the negotiations, seeing the context, uh, geopolitical situation uh, in the world, but also uh, it's more focused uh, to, to the economic growth, trade relationships and business partnership between India and UK. So we're very delighted that we have two very, very successful entrepreneurs and remarkable achievers with us representing the strong Indian diaspora in UK. And on a very personal note, my interaction with my students of University of Delhi, uh, when I came back from UK, uh, I felt that uh, uh, when I met uh, Lord Ranger on 15th March, just about a month back, uh, I felt that his story has to be told uh, to my students, his journey, his remarkable journey from all the struggles and the successes need to be narrated to my students so that they get inspired, enthused, motivated to do something beyond what the regular thinking 
is needed to be this kind of a achiever. And uh, your books, uh, From uh, Nothing to Everything, which you personally presented to me, and I'm so glad, uh, you know, because I got a chance to read that book, is awe inspiring narration of your life and journey. Uh, with spectacular successes. And, uh, uh, you know, your, your book, I, I showed it to my son who studies in University of Sheffield and I, I wanted him to get inspired and uh, to, to learn from this kind of, uh, um, uh, this kind of a, sort of a, a, a strength of character, uh, which allows you to weather all kinds of storms. Uh, so uh, it's it's beautiful. And I think the most beautiful quote that I remember from the foreword of your book, uh, which I personally related to, was of uh, Barry Gardner, the member of the Parliament UK, when he said that uh, Lord Ranger's story is unique with martyred father and a childhood of struggles and a flair of enterprise and innovation and a deep, deep sense of community and service. But his character is even more exceptional than his story. And I think the last line just resonates with me and because I met you personally. So absolutely delighted to have you. Uh, the second guest that we have today is Sharon Jandu. She's my friend. Uh, we met uh, around four years back in, in one of our business delegation uh, to Delhi. And in that fleeting uh, you know, uh, meeting for just about maybe one hour because she was heading for another meeting to Chandigarh, we established this strong linkages and uh, connection. She, uh, she is indeed a remarkable woman with spectacular skills, energy and positivity. I think she's a powerhouse. And also uh, at the same time, she amalgamates this character of humbleness, uh, which is so inspiring for me. Her long experience in Microsoft as a magistrate, as an entrepreneur, just adds on to her understanding and perception uh, towards inclusivity and diversity. And I'll not take any more time in, uh, you know, introducing Sharon, uh, because I think Principal Ma'am and Arman will do that while they speak. Uh, I'll stop here. I'll, I'll allow the uh, Arman to take forward uh, from here. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think both Principal Ma'am and Rupin, Professor Professor Rupinder Ma'am has have made my task very easy because both of our guests have been so comprehensively introduced now. So I think without further ado, we can move on to the meat and bones of the event, the lecture itself. So, but just because I feel that this bears reiteration, uh, Lord Ranger, before I invite you for the lecture, I would like to again emphasize on how the man who today is a British businessman, the founder of Sunmark, and also the chairman and managing director of Sea Air and Land, Form Land Forwarding Limited, was just a few years ago a, a little child born in Gujranwala in undivided India, who first hand experienced the ravages of India's partition. He's a stirring example of a life carved out of sheer grit, hard work, and determination. All of this is wonderfully encapsulated, as uh, Professor Rupinder pointed out, in, the, in his book, From Nothing to Everything, an inspiring saga of struggle and success from a two euro to a 200 million euro business. But better than me rambling on about Lord, uh, you know, this beautiful journey of Lord Ranger's wonderful life, I think we have a video which very comprehensively captures the spirit of it. So may I please request the technical team to play that video. I think it's a short two to three minute video. If you can just play that uh, for the audience. Rami Ranger, CBE of Mayfair. From a refugee camp to the House of Lords, Lord Ranger's story is a fascinating one, which is not only interesting, but also inspiring. He's a posthumous child who was born two months after the assassination of his illustrious father, Shaheed Nanak Singh, who was against the breakup of India on the basis of religion. Dr. Ranger was born in 1947 in Gujranwala, now in Pakistan. He was only two months old when the family had to flee with their young mother of just 35 years old and his seven siblings to a refugee train going to India. Ranger was given admission to the modern school in Patiala. After the completion of his school education, he went to Mahindra College and then obtained a BA degree from the government, College of Chandigarh. Ranger ceased his studies after reaching the UK where he had gone to study bar at law in May 1971. He overcame prejudices to achieve success on a scale that he could hardly have imagined in his wildest dreams. He shares his experiences in his rags to riches story in his book, From Nothing to Everything. Ranger knew there was no substitute for hard work and loyalty in order to achieve success. Today, Ranger is the chairman of Sunmark Limited and Sierra Land Forwarding Limited, two of Britain's fastest growing companies. 
His company sustained thousands of British jobs with their export activities to 130 countries. Both of his companies have received prestigious awards from Her Majesty the Queen, the Queen's Award for Export Achievement in 1999, and the Queen's Award for Enterprise in International Trade for an unprecedented five consecutive years, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013. No other company in Britain has received this accolade to date, and in the process, his company has set a new British business record. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in 2013, the Right Honourable David Cameron MP, presented the fifth Queen's Award to Ramy personally at his offices. Ranger's success hinges on his humility. Aside from business, he has devoted his life to build bridges in the community and has broken glass ceilings in the class-oriented British society to create his unique status to win admirers from far afield. From top politicians to across communities, Ranger is welcomed by all. Currently, Lord Ranger is a fellow of the Prince's Trust and is mentoring youth, which is his passion. He served as the Prime Minister's ambassador for apprenticeships for the food and drink industry past co-chair and now the patron of the Conservative Friends of India, ambassador to the Treasurer's Department of the Conservative Party, past chairman of the Conservative Party's annual foreign and Commonwealth dinner, chairman of the British Sikh Association, chairman of the Pakistan, India and UK Friendship Forum, patron of Combat Stress, patron of the Punjabi Society of the British Isles and vice chairman of the Indian Gymkhana and trustee of the Gandhi statue in Parliament Square are just some of the positions held by Lord Ranger today. Ranger has won numerous awards for his business achievements and philanthropic activities. In 2005, he was made a member of the British Empire and in 2016, he was made a commander of the British Empire for his services to British business and the Asian community. He also won the Institute of Directors Director of the Year Award in 2013. Ranger believes in supporting education and helping to provide better facilities for students. To support the community, he donated £250,000 to London South Bank University to set up the Dr. Rami Ranger CBE Entrepreneurship Centre to help would-be entrepreneurs. He has donated £200,000 to the University of West London towards a new pavilion in the campus library and to enhance facilities for university students. Remy donated £100,000 to the Gandhi Memorial Foundation Trust, which raised funds to erect a statue of Mahatma Gandhi in Parliament Square, London. In all, Remy has done his best to put back into society from where we have received so much and become the change he wants to see. I think that video very wonderfully, comprehensively, holistically captures uh, the beauty of uh, the struggle, the hardships and the life which Lord Ranger has had. With that being said, you have the floor, sir. You can begin with the lecture. Thank you, Arman. Thank you for your warm introduction and warm welcome. I am very grateful to Professor Viva Singh Chuhan for inviting me along with Rupinder O'Brien and uh, I think Ishika Sing Singhal also somewhere. But I'm indebted to all of you for giving me this opportunity to share my life journey with you, especially the young students who have a great future ahead of you. And again, it is very, very important that you must appreciate that we are all architect of our own fortune or sometimes misfortune by not taking things seriously. If you take things seriously, the world is your oyster. It is a great honor for me to share my life journey with you because I believe if I share my philosophy with you, then you will appreciate how easy it is to be successful in life. You know, we Indian people have certain values. Values are very, very important. Value system makes us what we are. There are people with no values and they cannot add anything extra to their, their own life and to the life of others. So therefore values are very, very important. And I will discuss the value, the importance of value as we go along. <clears throat> they say we should try to follow those with proven track record of success because, you know, no one is born successful, no one is born bad, criminal or anything, but you are, you become one by the company you keep or the choices you make. So it's very, very important that you make those cho choices correctly because short-term gain can become a long-term losses. 
So therefore, we learn from others. You know, we are blessed in India. We have got some community which are known for entrepreneurship, like the Sindhi community, like the Gujarati or the Mawari. They they have that business sense in their blood, and we pick up <clears throat> something from them as well because they, after all, they're all Indian, and we live with them, and we can learn from something. But again, it is very very easy for you to be what you want to be. If you want to be a politician, you just have to co copy a politician <clears throat> and just follow what he does or he does. Or if you want to be a doctor, you know you have to study six years to become a doctor. So life is very simple. You make a choice what you want to be and you set about achieving those goals. <clears throat> it is always good to learn from others' experience simply because we cannot learn or experience everything ourselves. Life is too short. And if we want to start you know, learning from our own experience, we will not learn much. As you know, I'm chairman of Sunmark Limited and C. Aaron Land Foundry Limited, two of Britain's fastest growing company. One is marketing fast moving consumer goods known as FMCG, you know, which you find them in supermarket. And the other is a logistic company which moves cargo from A to B and import. <clears throat> Both the companies have been recognized by Her Majesty the Queen for their contribution to the British economy. Sierra Land was given Queen's Award for Export in 1999. And as you heard, Sunmark is the only company in Britain to have won an unprecedented five consecutive Queen's Award in international trade. No other British company has this accolade. I was also made member of British Empire in 2005, commander of British Empire in 2016, and a life peer in 2019 for service to British business and Asian community. I have demonstrated that one does not need a rich father, elite education, family wealth, or the old school boy network to be successful in life. However, one needs certain qualities, and luckily, we are born with those qualities. My father, unfortunately, was assassinated before my birth for opposing the breakup of India on the basis of religion. He could foretell the consequences of religious disharmony. He pleaded with the then Muslim leader not to cut and run and fall for the British divide and rule policy, which had become divide and run. But unfortunately, the fanatic could not appreciate his vision of a united India free from rivalry and assassinated him when he was trying to save some student of DAV school, Multan, who were caught, who got caught in communal riots uh, when they were protesting against the partition of India. They came under attack. My father went to save them. He managed to save the student, but he lost his own life for the Hindu-Muslim unity in India. My, li my life began in a refugee camp in India, age two months and no father. However, I was fortunate to have a remarkable mother who worked as a teacher and brought eight of us through immense difficulty, having lost her country and sister home and husband. So that was a very challenging life for a young lady of 35 years old with eight children. You can imagine it's difficult to manage even one or two children. In those days, they used to have a large family. <clears throat> she could not give us financial help, but instill the right values in us. Again, I was talking to you about the values. It's not the wealth. You could be born rich, but if you don't have the wealth values, your wealth will disappear. You could even end up a, a druggie or all sorts of bad habits. So values are, again and again, I emphasize on having the values which will guide you throughout your life. <clears throat> so we were eight of us, which my mother brought up through very difficult such situation, but in her word was you will study, you can starve, but you must study. But anyway, luckily we all realize that we are in a very difficult situation. We lost everything. So we have to behave ourselves. Five of her sons became commissioned officer in the Indian Armed Forces, and she got the title Proudest Indian Mother. I came to this country in 1971 to study law. Due to financial difficulty, I could not study. So I had to decided to return 
back to India to complete my study. But I had lost a lot of money. I sold my motorbike and sold my things. So I decided to take a job to make up some money. And wherever I went, they asked for experience. I had no experience. So the first job was a car cleaner. So I started my life in the United Kingdom as a car cleaner. My second job was working for KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, 35p an hour. <clears throat> However, through sheer hard work, in less than two years, I became a district manager and in charge of day-to-day -day running of 10 stores. I also gained experience in electrical wholesale companies, uh, Curry's and Dixon, and then McCain Food. I discovered that with just five principles, I was able to surge ahead. And these are the principles and the values which we are born with. Luckily, we all have them because they don't cost anything. You don't have to go to any university to get them. They are self-respect, good work ethics, commitment, vision, and empty for others. So these are very, very important. Self-respect is very important. Because if without self-respect, we will cut corner and would not hesitate in letting our customer, employer, or teacher, or friends, or anyone who deal with us, we will not hesitate letting them down because we have no self-respect. If somebody insults me, so what? Doesn't matter. So therefore, it is very, very important that you preserve your respect and don't allow anyone to mistreat you or insult you or think that you are not a reliable person. <clears throat> So therefore, people will only take you seriously if you are an honorable person. <clears throat> Work ethic is very, very important. We must show loyalty to our employers, customers, suppliers, you know, anyone we deal with, we have to show. In my business, our motto is very simple. We only succeed when our customers succeed. We work very hard for the success of our customer because that their success in turn become our success. You know, if, if a customer loses money, we make his losses good because money we can always earn back. But if you lose a customer, he will take 10 customers with him. Reputation is very, very important. So therefore, it's very, very important that we have ethics. Without ethics, you are not going to go far. Empty for others is very, very important. You have to empathize with other people. You have to put people in their position, how would you like to be treated? You can't have an attitude, I'm all right, Jack. You have to make sure that you appreciate the position and situation of other people and work to add value, whatever you can do. <clears throat> no company can grow uh, grows if the customers are suffering because, as I said, I'm all right, Jack approach. If we treat our customer right, then we can build reputation, which is essential to grow our business. Number four is uh, empty. No, number three. Where we go? Number three. Uh, well, ethics, uh, self-respect, ethics, empty for others, and the number four is important to have vision. As without vision, one is like headless chicken, unable to find its destination. You have to have vision where you are, where you wish to be, and how you need to reach there. What action, what effort you have to put to reach your destination. You've got to have an objective and a goal in your life, and then you have to work toward it. <clears throat> we need total commitment. That's the five, fifth one, commitment. Total commitment to work as there is no substitute of hard work. We Indian people in this country overcame our handicap by working extra. It was total commitment. If the Englishman worked eight hours, we worked 10 hours. If they worked five days, we worked six days. So we overcame our drawbacks by working extra. Those who watched the clock continue to do so while those who work their work, watch their work, surge ahead. I started my logistic company in 1987 with a capital of just two pounds in a shed. I, you know, it was a service industry where you don't need lots of money to buy plant and machinery. It was just service. You know, I had to pick up cargo from A and send it to B. So there were no investment needed. The marketing company was launched in 1995. Uh, it is now exporting British product 
to 130 country with stagnation. I talked about vision. When I was working as a freight forwarding company, logistic company, I came across a lot of customers who wanted to buy British product. So I realized that if I help them source product, that I will save them a lot of money. We start of buy for six, seven places, they can buy for me. And you know, you make profit while buying. If you're buying is right, you're selling is right. So by buying for one place, they were able to save a lot of money. And they were getting deliveries on time and they were getting no charges for deliveries and all that. Anyway, so bottom line is you have to spot an opportunity, which I did by thinking. And then I did, I, I also went further because we were exporting branded products like Cadbury, Nestle, McVitie's, Mars, Beecham, all these big, big brands. And you know, to promote brands, it costs a lot of money for advertising, marketing, and sales support. I decided to create my own brand without the cost of the multinationals. I went back to those companies. I said, if you make brand under my brand, my labels, I don't want to pay for your advertising, your marketing, or your distribution cost. And I was able to get the same product 30% cheaper because I realized there's a market for Mercedes, but there's also a market for Toyota. So therefore, there are people in Africa, Middle East, Caribbean, they are unable to buy branded products because they're too expensive because of the cost they involved in marketing them. So I got my own product and they are really doing so well because the same quality, same taste, same everything, but 30% cheaper. So because you know you have to have the same taste because people acquire taste. You can't give them different. If people like Haldiram, they will go to Haldiram no matter what the cost is. So I realized that I have to maintain the same taste, otherwise there'll be rejection. Anyway, so that is how the success went from you know, uh, from one step to the other. <clears throat> Our company was added to the Sunday Times profit track 100 for the past three years. I also became institute of director. They were all surprised that this guy is clever. He has invented, he didn't invent the wheel, but he improved the wheel. You know, people want bag, but not everybody can afford Chanel bag, but they still need a good bag. So I offered them good quality product at a price that was right. Now, so how did I do it? You know, it's very, very important to know how one can do it. Simply by understanding your business or your work or whatever thoroughly, deep. You know, less knowledge is very dangerous. With little knowledge, you can get by, but you will never shine. Here's an example. I always ask this example to people I'll give lecture to or talk to, that two, two medical students, they study in the same college, same length of time, same book, same professor, same everything. Yet one ends up in Harley Street. It's a street where top surgeons practice and people travel thousands of miles to come to them. Harley Street is a very famous street for doctors. And then the other one, same MBBS certificate, will work in an ordinary clinic. The difference is very simple. But the man in Harley Street is very conscious of his respect. You know, when you earn respect, you will, your reputation will earn you more money. So this doctor in Harley Street is very conscious that he doesn't want to make mistake because his reputation is what brings customer to him. So he will spend a great deal of time trying to diagnose his patient correctly. If need be, he will take a second opinion, third opinion, because he's not in rush. But the guy, in once he diagnosed the patient correctly, he will think again, what is the best course of treatment? But the person in ordinary clinic has no time. He's always constantly in rush. He just couldn't care less about his own respect. If somebody doesn't get better quickly or somebody die, it doesn't matter. So that's the difference that when you work to, as my mother used to say, son, money even drug dealer will have. Respect is what you want to earn because without respect, the money has no value. So my request to you is that you always work to earn respect. Money, you know, all sorts of people have got money. Yes, but the respect is very hard to earn 
you can't buy respect either. So <clears throat> this is how uh, the, the, the situation is that mediocrity will not bring us the desired result. Casual effort will generate casual result. It's as simple as that. We may be able to get by, but we will not make a mark. So they say excellence endures. It remains long after everything else is forgotten. If I was ask anyone how much you paid for the shirt or jacket or whatever, you won't remember the price, but you remember the quality. So that is very, very important that you, whatever you do, you add value. Many of you will start your work by working for others and many you may move it to your own family business. In case you start in the family business, my suggestion is that you start to learn the rope from the bottom up. Because unless you go right deep into your job, you will not be have strong foundation. You will wobble. You know, you got the promotion, but you don't have the knowledge. So therefore, it's very important to build your foundation with knowledge very strong. For those who will start their career with working for other people, you should work as if it is your own business. If you just work to please other people, then you will not realize your true potential. You'll only be just doing to please other people, not to get the best out of you and to see, test your own metal. So it's very important you consider that business as your own business and put 110%. We must have ability to get on with our superior and junior alike. It's very, very important. Our superior have more responsibilities and more pressure. So therefore, empathize with them, try to take some pressure from them by being a, you know, cooperative and uh, uh, by empathizing them. But with the junior, you have to make sure that they understand the rationale behind your instruction. You don't want them just typewriter or yes people. By giving them knowledge and the background to what we're doing, you will get a lot more out of them. <clears throat> so this is how attitude is very, very important. You know, attitude toward your senior, your junior will determine, you know, how you are respected. And we must make them important by encouraging them because they are also the future of your company. You know, there's one more thing I would say, we must add value to whatever we do. It's very, very important. For example, anyone can serve McDonald's, you know, you good. But if someone who will be polite and greet you, good morning, how are you? What can I do for you? He will bring respect, not only to the establishment, but to himself as well. So therefore, try to see what extra can I add from my side? Uh, and that, that will be your browning point. We must always mix with people, higher, you know, more successful than us. It's very, very important because people who are successful, they have done something right to be where they are. So we should not get jealous of them. We should insp get inspiration from them and uh, try to be in the company of right people. As they say, you're judged by the company you keep. You must join organization or, or, or whatever uh, represents your field of work because that way you will be able to network with the right people and you will also be kept abreast of what is going on in your industry. Now, difference between success and failure is very little. A successful person will help others to be liked because he will like to do something good for other people so that he's respected because he's an asset. But the failure expect it to be his divine right to be liked by people, regardless of his own action and deeds. So therefore, it's very, very important. No one has a right to be res respected or loved. You have to. As they say, bad mechanic will always blame his tool. You have to earn your own respect by giving people something they will appreciate. It is always important that you remain an asset because an asset is respected by family, friends, and employers and staff or whatever. An integral part of business is finding solution. Yeah, because you know you it's a very challenging field being an entrepreneur 
and you have to find solution to grow, to be competitive and to fight the competition because it's everywhere. Competition is everywhere. People are trying to take your business away. So this is very simple. In order to grow your business, you either have to merge with somebody, you have to acquire a company, or you have to have strategic alliance to grow. Either you merge, you acquire, or to have a strategic alliance. As I started my company with just two pounds, I could I could neither buy a company nor anyone wanted to merge with me. I was left with a third choice, building strategic alliances. So I went out in the market to find like-minded people who were like me, wanted to grow, but didn't have the resources. So by joining hand with them, we became credible force. This is how I moved into hundreds of country by having a strategic alliances with the local distributors. They say when you share your profit, you share your work, but you double your strength. My business is based on cooperation and collaboration with like-minded people. Because you know you can't fight big competition alone if you don't have the resources. By using strategic partner, you can really be a, a force to be reckoned with. More importantly, when you export, you need the local knowledge. Who better to give you that knowledge than a local partner? So it is very, very important. And then you will ask me, how do we find strategic partners? Very simple. Hidden talent is no talent. If you can sing, you must sing. If you can dance, you must dance. Therefore, if you have a talent, you must show the world. So we exhibit in trade shows because not many people come to sightseeing in trade show. Nobody comes. They are serious people. And in the trade show, we come across potential strategic partners who are also looking to develop their business or customer. So it's very, very important that if you are in business, you must exhibit in trade shows. So that's where you will find lots of lots of good people. <clears throat> if you find yourself in an export business, the best place is to go to the local embassy high commissioner and to ask them to help you find strategic partner or companies in the similar field. There are Department of Trade, Department of Business, there's so many organizations like you have FICI, Confederation of Indian Industry, so many. By becoming their member, you can get to know so many people and that's so. And I believe step-by-step -step approach to grow our business is the right one. I never encourage anyone to take risk with their own livelihood and that of their staff and put their family into difficulties or their staff. So therefore, we are not desperate. We do not have a competition with anyone. People have different circumstances. Uh, so we just remain individual. Do not take a risk because taking risk is not, every time somebody takes a risk, there might be one or two success, but there are many failures also. So just grow organically, grow from the profit. Don't grow by taking big loans from the bank because if sometimes the business can be a, uh, have hit a bad turn and you could be, you find yourself exposed. So I can summarize my approach to business with the following analogy. Our approach to business must never be like a hunter who goes for a quick kill. Instead, it should be like a farmer who works very hard over the period of time for a bumper crop. And before I conclude, I would like to pay tribute to my adopted country, Great Britain. It is because of British sense of tolerance and fair play that an ordinary immigrant like me could realize his dream and become asset for his country, adopted country, and mother country, and my family. So it is very, very important that we do not discriminate against our own people because you can all easily turn them into liability instead of assets. In Britain, like in India, we have laws against discrimination of any kind. So that is the strength of a country where everyone is equal uh, and not put at a disadvantage. Beside 
no country can move forward by leaving any section of its population behind. So we have to move all together and uh, become a success for all around. So that is my story. And I hope you found some pieces of interest to you. So thank you. Thank, thank you so, so much for that, uh, Lord Ranger. This was indeed very uh, illuminating. And I think um, you've, you've spoken about commitment, about ethic, about self-respect, about vision, about empathy, about all of these ideals which have undergirded your journey. And it's, it's, I think it's very, very enlightening for our students here. It's something which we can learn, of course, from the Indian diaspora and the UK, the team, of course, being about how significant that diaspora is, especially in context of the global scenario. And I think, you know, it's, it's a, you, you're a wonderful living example of it. And I think uh, you, you've been very modest, sir, because you haven't mentioned grit. And I think listening to your history about where you come from, your humble origins in Pakistan and Gujranwala and, you know, becoming this huge entrepreneur who's, who, who has this international renown, it's, it's just amazing. It's, it's awe-inspiring. And I think you've been too modest in that sense. And I think I'll just point out this beautiful metaphor you've given about how a hunter, you know, brings about benefit in the short term, but it's the farmer who brings about the long-term sustainable benefit. And it's that metaphor, which a lot of us, I think, will resonate with. With that being said, thank you for that, sir. May I now welcome our second eminent guest, Madam Sharon Chandu, the director of the Yorkshire Asian Business Association, formerly, of course, the head of strategic partnerships and business development at Microsoft as well, and an active member of the Indian diaspora in the UK with initiatives like the Federation of Small Businesses, uh, Global Enterprise Links Limited, and much, much more to her belt. The floor is absolutely yours, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Oman. Um, that was a, a lovely presentation by uh, Lord Ramiji. I mean, how can I follow that? Um, good, uh, good afternoon, um, Professor uh, Viva Singh Chauhan. Um, thank you so much for your introduction. And good afternoon, Professor Rupinda Oberoi, who is not just a close friend, she's become a family, family member, somebody who I feel very, very close to. And over the last four years, I feel as if I've known you all my life. Uh, what can I say about um, Lord Ranger? Uh, Lord Ranger is an absolutely remarkable and exceptional person. I've known him for the last couple of years and he has gone above and beyond to support me. Uh, my last two um, events that I held at the, the House of Lords, um, Lord Ranger has personally overseen them. And as somebody who is just hanging on his coattails, I mean, it's an absolute privilege to, um, to be speaking on the same platform as, uh, as Ramiji, as Lord Ranger, because actually you've just heard breathtaking in terms of his experiences, his values, his work ethics, um, his five principles, the, the foundations of, of what is actually required um, to become that remarkable human being. I mean, absolutely outstanding, um, Ramiji. And I hope that you're always there in my life. Hope you're always there mentoring me because since you've been there, um, I've seen what you've done for me. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much um, to Girimal um, College um, for inviting me to become a speaker at the Frank Takradas uh, lecture series. I mean, you know, what a remarkable individual um, and actually because of uh, Rupinda I mean I'll call you I won't call you Rupinda G I'll call you Rupinda because you, you are younger than me you're my family you're my younger sister um, I just feel as if I know all your students as well because when I when I share my um, story um, I'll talk about some of the things that we've been doing Rupinda in terms of me and and my background it is um, it, it's nothing compared to uh, what what um, Ramiji has shared, but I will uh, make a little bit of an attempt to, to share a little bit of my background, a little bit of what I've been doing, and also share a little bit about uh, what the Yorkshire Asian Business Association is doing and what we've been doing regarding the Northern Asian Power List and the Power Group, uh, and how we are actually really trying to showcase the Asian community, the Indian community, the Indian diaspora, um, and actually really build on those links between the diaspora and a country of origin. And actually, I'd like to say that uh, my parents came to the country in the 1960s. So even though um, I was made in England, 
Um, I don't know what it is about India, um, but I just, <laughs> you just feel really passionate about India. You just feel that you really belong. Um, and I suppose that only came to me um, in the last, I would say, 10, 15 years. Prior to that, I was like any other individual in the UK, sort of like building my career, building my family, getting everything in order. But actually visiting India, meeting the people of India, I just realized, I thought, oh my God, I've got so much in common with them. You know, I actually really get it. And I suppose that's probably what Prime Minister Modi talks about when he talks about that living bridge, that connect between the diaspora. And when, when you go there, sometimes it just feels like home to home. Um, so really, I think that was one of the reasons why one of the ideas that I had about creating the platform of engaging non-Asian businesses with India came about. And just, just sort of like to expand that thought also, um, I have one, one son and it's so funny, even though, you know, he's sort of like, you know, third generation. And when you, when you see him, when you speak to him and Rupin does have the opportunity of meeting my son, Juggy, um, he's a proper, you know, proper Yorkshire lad, born and bred in Yorkshire. We call that the Punjab of, uh, of the UK, really nice, green, friendly, lovely, warm people. I don't know what it is about him, but <laughs> when he sees India, you know, whether they're playing cricket or anything, he's such a true supporter of India. And I, I don't understand how that's come about, even though he's sort of third generation over here. All his schooling is done here. You know, his friends are, you know, from the British community. Um, I think that's quite fascinating. I think that's a lot to be said about India, the warmth of India. It, it is so infectious, it's so invaluable. And the power of India is, is just, it's just it's just unbelievable and I think one of the other things that you feel really proud of when when you hear about you know India being on that global map when you see the world leaders and you see the the Indian prime minister standing there shoulder to shoulder you just you know even though I was born here you just get that sense of pride so I suppose I think you know it, it's something really to be proud of to belong to the Indian diaspora and it's something that I showcase and I suppose I've used that over the last I would say four to five years since I actually I left Microsoft about three years ago to really build out some of the ideas that I've had and I've used that um, that connection with Rupinder to to look at that vision so we can actually expand some of those ideas and not just you know, build out the ideas and, and build out some of the business um, things that we've been doing, but actually have a lot of fun and a real enjoyment in terms of what we've been doing. Before I go into um, exactly what we've been doing over the last four to five years, I'll just sort of um, talk a little bit about the facts as well. I mean, not only does, you know, the UK and India share that wonderful, valuable, rich historical connection, which brings us together, you know, whether it's a language, whether it's cultural links, whether it's the food. India actually is the fourth largest investor in the UK. There are over 850 Indian companies operating in the UK with a combined revenue of over 50 billion. And um, Professor Deva Singh alluded to the fact that Prime Minister um, Boris Johnson is visiting India. I think he can't wait. I mean, if it wasn't for COVID, he would have been over there like a shot last year. Um, I'm very close to the Secretary of State, Anne-Marie Trevelyan. She was very, very kind enough alongside uh, Lord Rainderji and Lord Bellamoria to host our global trade um, round table that we held at the House of Lords, which Rupinder attended, um, alongside the, um, the female leaders of the Commonwealth, the Indian Commonwealth, um, she's so passionate about India and I think, you know, everybody feels very, very affectionate towards India. So I think, you know, Boris Johnson is going to have a, a very fruitful visit when he's, he's across there. But if you look at the, not only is uh, our, there are so many Indian investors in the UK, um, you've also got non-Indian people working for these Indian investors. And, I, and I, I'm led to believe that the Indian companies are the, the largest private sector individ, in, uh, Indian comp uh, investors in the UK, which is really, really powerful. Um, it's already been said that the British Indian community is India's sixth largest diaspora, comprising of over, over 1.4 million people in the UK, and very, very proud of having those Indian connections. So just, just on that fact, 
um, the Asian um, diaspora, even though then that's combined, we make up less than 8% of the UK population. We contribute to over 10% of GDP, which is very, very powerful. That um, notion came to me about, um, I would say, about six years ago. Um, I used to be um, the, so one of my careers was I used to be one of the project directors at Santander. So my background was really into entrepreneurialism and really into encouraging the, um, the business community. And that's not just the Asian business community, but businesses to expand. That was my background. Um, and that followed from a career with the Institute of Financial Accountants when I was a director of marketing communications. But when I was at Santander, I was given a project which was to develop develop um, a program to help small businesses really grow. So when I talk about small businesses, I'm looking at businesses with a turnover of less than 25 million um, and actually predominantly with the, within the five to 10 million um, pound so that's sterling bracket. business community um, within the within the UK. So the project really was to how do you help them um, grow? How do you help them prosper? How do you help a 10 million business become a 25 million business? How do you help a 25 million business become a 50 million business and to develop a program um, to encourage their growth and their support? Um, and that was a really exciting project at Santander. At the same time, an individual called Uwe Delakia was running something called the Leicestershire Asian Business Community. And I was very new to that because actually I was very much in the mainstream and I didn't really understand why, why he was doing this. Um, because for, I would say for about most of my life, I, I have operated in the, in the mainstream. So I didn't really have much exposure to the Asian business community. Um, but Ude de Lakia, um, in, in the Midlands region was running a network of Asian businesses. And what happened was he'd approached Santander to, to look at how can he develop um, and launch the National Asian Business Association. Um, he'd already got on board at that time. The, the, the Secretary of State for Business was Vince... Vince oh, Remind me, Lord Ranger, um, who was it? The Liberal Democrats, Vin Vince Cable, got it, Vince Cable. It was, um, it, was the, it was the alliance between the Conservative Party and Lib Dems at the time. So Vince Cable uh, was the business um, secretary at the time. And Santander was, was going to support this, the launch of the National Asian Business Association. So I, none of the other project directors at Santander were really interested in that program. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I'll have a little look at that. And when I looked at it, it was phenomenal because what it was, was actually, how do you use the diaspora, in particular, the Indian diaspora in the Midlands region and then nationally to link up with the country of origin, but actually use relationships, use culture, use friendship, use knowledge to build those bridges. And at that time, uh, Prime Minister Modi was the Chief Minister of Gujarat and he was looking at a program in, of invest in Gujarat at the time. And Uday Dalakirji was very, very close to um, Prime Minister sorry, Chief Minister Modi at the time. And a lot of the Gujaratis were resident in the Midlands region. So brands such as CoFresh, East End Foods, um, Patek's, brands such as those, they originated from the Gujarat region. So they were using their links and their connections to actually build their businesses, to look at supply chain, and to actually um, develop that, that real understanding and that economic partnership, as well as friendship. So I thought this is a really great project and um, went on to launch it. At the same time, I then got headhunted to work for Microsoft, uh, managed to um, convince Microsoft at the time. By the, by the way, Sachin Nadella wasn't the um, CEO. In fact, um, he was just about to join Microsoft where I think I was a year in. It was um, Ballmer at the time. Um, he was a CEO. Of, of Microsoft, but um, managed to get Microsoft uh, and Santander to launch the National Asian Business Association at Microsoft offices. Um, and that's when I realized the real power of the Asian community, the diaspora, 
in the UK. And that's when I decided to develop something in Yorkshire because the strength of NAVA was actually its regional connectivity. So regionally, um, the diaspora was, was very strong in the south. It was also very, very strong in the Midlands region. But in Yorkshire and in the north, it didn't really have that connection. It wasn't really connected. It was quite a fragmented community. And actually, when you have fragmentation, what you need to do is to look at how can you get values? How can you bring people together and really build on those strengths and look at the commonalities and share those common purposes, those common goals, and then look at how can you work together. So back in 2014, uh, we launched, got a you know, bunch of people together who actually liked that vision of, of NABA, the National Asian Business Association, connected, and then we launched the, the Yorkshire Asian Business Association. And from, from, from that, we just grew. Um, and in terms of growing, we, we managed to get other um, Asian businesses to join our network. And our purpose really was to connect to share ideas, to share common, uh, to, you know, common practice, um, and actually to look at how can we work together and, and grow our businesses, and then actually how can we link back to country of origin and, and build on that connectivity. Um, and also, how can you link with professional institutions? Because one of the, one of the I would say, the barriers that the Asian business community had in the North in particular, with, within Yorkshire, I would say, was the fact that as a community, they connected, but with professional services, with organizations that could help and build their growth, or with access to social capital or people with ideas, they didn't really have that. So what, what we did at Yabba was we introduced them to organizations such as the DIT, such as professional bodies, such as their local growth hubs, such as the business organizations that would really help them grow because they were actually quite tight knit within their own communities. So we introduced them to um, outside organizations that would help them help them grow. And that organization really grew. So from a bunch of people getting together, we're now up to 4,000 members and, um, and organizing events, organizing um, sort of mentoring sessions, also doing work within schools as well. And one of the things that we also do is that we try to attract the non-Asian businesses to become members of our network because our ultimate goal was actually to look at how can we encourage non-Asian businesses to look at trade opportunities with, with India? And that, I would say, has been a phenomenal success because when we looked at people who we have conversations with, people who are our business partners, who are members of the Federation of Small Businesses, the Institute of Directors, people who are members of the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, India has always been something that they'd like to do business with, but ne they never really understood how can they do that. So in a sense, our network, our simple network, was a really good facilitator, a really good platform to bring people together, to share those common goals, to share those values, and to understand and learn from each other. And, and, and I suppose that really grew. Um, as the network grew as well. And then back in um, 2018, I believe, that was my, or 2017, that was my first trade mission where I thought, wouldn't it be a really good idea to take a group of non-Asian businesses to learn and explore India? And with the help and support of the DIT and other professional bodies in India. And at the time I was working quite closely with the CII and FICI, because you learn you know, how to expand your network. We put together a very simple program and encouraged non-Asian businesses to look at trade opportunities um, with, with India. And at the same time, as I was building my own network, that's when I came across um, Professor Oberoi. And while we were at the Taj in Delhi, I think we met over, over breakfast. And that's when I realized that actually we had so much more in common um, that, you know, even though, you know, we were thousands of miles apart, our upbringing, our values, our shared interests, um, and as, as, you know, Indian women. So even though I was 
brought up here in the UK, um, I could really relate to um, Rupinder's upbringing. And even though Rupinder was, you know, bo born and bred in India, she could relate to my upbringing. We just connected. And I think that connection just led us to really develop not just Yabba, the Yorkshire Asian Business Association, but the formation of the Northern Asian Power List, the Northern Asian Power Group, and then the Northern Asian Power Think Tank, which is looking more at policy level and really expanding our reach. One of the other ideas that came from developing that reach was my exposure was to, to the UK, to um, British institutions, the British universities. What Lupinda did was she, she opened up the horizon, so I had exposure to the Indian um, universities, Indian students, and I was absolutely blown away with um, Rupinder's students. Um, and I think over the, over the last couple of years, we worked on a couple of projects. Uh, one project in particular, um, because we couldn't do a trade mission, so we were planning a trade mission again to, to look at bringing non-Asian businesses to India, to have a look at you know, trade opportunities, to really build on the economic partnership. Um, we decided to take it online and it was supposed to be a one day event it then became a five day event and that was phenomenal it was that was not just g to g government to government it was b to b and then it was education partnerships over the five days i mean on the first day we were graced with uh, lord ranger's uh, presence to to join the inaugural session you know we had minister stewart who was there we we also had um the high commissioner um, Alex Elliot, who just Alex Ellis, who just joined, it was his second day in post um, with in Delhi, who joined as well as a speaker, prestigious speaker, and that was phenomenal as well. And then we we decided that how do we top that? You know, what's the next stage? And again, you know that that leads on to um, you know some of the values that um, Lord Ranger G has, has talked about that it's important to have vision. And it's an, an, you know, important to really think about what's your next step. But it's also important to be agile. And it's also important to, to understand that the world is changing. I think between us, we then realise that there's a real opportunity to capitalise on the real talent, you know, within India. So that talent, that real rich sort of human talent, the student talent. Um, and that's when we developed the project, Let's Talk Business India which went down you know, so well. And I do apologize for the noise, actually. I'm so sorry. It was very quiet when I started here. And I'm now in the middle of my talk. I can't even move. So sincerest apologies for the noise, the background noise. I hope it's not too disruptive. Um, but the, the Let's Talk Business project was where we got our heads together. That was Rupinder and I and thought about how do we really make that experience of UK businesses looking at um, investing in India, looking at joint venture opportunities in India, and then also looking at, because I had the talent in the UK, but how do we, how do we create that same opportunity with, with India? Um, and that's where the idea of creating Let's Talk Business, where we had a team of students. So we had the wonderful opportunity of recruiting um, some outstanding students who joined us on Let's Talk Business. And I think I saw Himanshu on the call. Again, absolutely outstanding individual. And I'll, and I'll be honest with you, I've met some outstanding students in the UK, but I've, I've never met students that get 98, 99%. And the commitment, the drive of the Indian student, they were just, I mean, so, you know, I can, I can safely say that the Indian economy is very, very safe with the current students that are coming up through India. Absolutely outstanding. Every single one of you that I've, I've had the opportunity to meet on those calls when we developed the project Let's Talk Business. Resilience, hard work, commitment, you know, dedication, second to none um, in terms of, of what, you, what you've got there. Um, in India. So very, very proud of, of what you're achieving. And I think that project, we started to work on that. And we are still developing that. I mean, Rupinder may, may fill the gaps later on, but we are still developing that. And the plan is to, to really build that relationship, to really strengthen that relationship 
you know, education partnerships um, and then building those business relationships. So actually it benefits not just in terms of friendship, but it ben benefits in terms of economic partnerships as well. So I suppose, you know, you've got Prime Minister Johnston and you've got Prime Minister Modi looking at it at high level, at policy level. How do you actually translate that? Will you translate that with people, human capital, social capital, and really getting those exchanges going and get those conversations going with those values that, that Lord Ranger has already said, you know, around dignity, self-respect, work ethic on both sides, commitment, um, understanding where each is coming from, understanding cultural barriers, differences, and respecting those as well. You know, it's really, really important to do that. Uh, and what we do at Yabba and the Northern Asian Power Group is that we actually celebrate all the cultural sort of um, festivals here and we we love them and what we find is that when we celebrate cultural values and celebrate cultural festivals here in Yorkshire we have such a wonderful turnout um, and people learn about what is, what's important you know to to our respective countries because they, they also understand that if we want to do business in India then we really need to understand and respect the values of the Indian culture the Indian heritage and also have respect of the past as well. That's very, very important. Um, you know, I think that's that has become very, very important that the relationship, the dynamic between the two countries is different. You know, even there have been some, there has, there has been a history. Some of the history has been quite challenging, but we learn from that. And I think the, the dignity and um, the values and the fact that you know Lord Ranger brought that into his presentation that we learn from history but we bring we bring the positivity out from that to actually build on the future and I suppose what we're trying to do here in Yorkshire and in the UK is to really look to India as a really positive future I mean you know the UK has come out of, of Europe they are looking at strong partnerships and one of the key things that we're trying to push here um, at, your, at Yabba is to really look at India as a destination in a two-way, it is a two-way process. Um, Rupinda talked about the fact that when she came to the UK, um, that I was her host, and that's learning from the values of real Indian culture that a host or a guest, you know, she was a guest in my country. Of course, I would go above and beyond to make sure that she, she is valued as that and show her off, actually. I was very proud. You know, I, I showed her off to all my friends. And in fact, She's now their friend as well. They can't wait to see her again. And likewise, when, when I go to India, the hospitality that, that I get when I go to India is, again, second to none. And we've got a lot to learn here. And I really hope, moving forward, that the Indian diaspora over here, that we don't lose those cultural values that, that India has taught us, that, that my parents have given me, that my in-laws that gave me, that actually, you know, self-respect, you know, good work ethic, hard work and um, values having a value-based society that we we never lose that and i think the key to all of this is actually taking the best of both cultures um lord ranger talked about the the british having a very strong um policy very strong values on equality diversity they've got some bad things but they've got some very very powerful things and we take that you know we take that and we want to we want to showcase that the whole idea around democracy the whole idea around you know respecting the law and equality and again bringing in the cultural values of what India brings. We want to highlight that. And we never want to lose that over here. One of the things that we try to champion at Yabba is the values, the cultural values that we have as a community um, over here. And I think we try to champion that. Only yesterday, um, I attended a really wonderful festival, which was celebrating Vasaki. So we celebrate Vasaki over here with real pomp and real you know sort of splendor and not only within the Sikh community our Muslim community attend our Hindu community attend we celebrate Holi we celebrate Diwali we celebrate Eid we celebrate everything you know we celebrate Easter as well because actually a value-based society a value-based community is a strong community 
all of the five values that, that Lord Ranger talked about becoming a, a businessman, he never talked about money. He never talked about earning money or the bottom line. So when you go to business presentations, they talk about the bottom line, they talk about human capital, they talk about social capital. The values that um, Lord Ranger has shared with you, they talk about self-respect, talk about good work ethic, they talk about you, you know, they talk about your commitment, they talk about your empathy, and they talk about you having vision, they talk about you doing your homework. And I think if we can even have a smidgen of that, I think, and even if we can have a smidgen of what Lord Ranger has achieved, I think we've done really, really well. I think if I can even have a smidgen of what, a little bit of what, what Lord Ranger has achieved, I think I will feel, I will feel that I've achieved a lot in my life and I'm, and I'm looking to, to do that. So I think if you can all learn from what Lord Ranger has said, I mean, I'm still learning every single day I learn. In fact, my son is my, my best teacher. He's my best critic. He's the one that, that helps me. He really shines a light on everything what I do and holds me you know, up to account. Um, and I think if we can be our own self-critic, we can really keep ourselves on that path. Um, and I think it's important to do that because then everything else follows, absolutely everything else follows. So I'm really looking forward to, you know, building on that relationship with uh, Rupinda. Um, I'm currently doing my MBA at the University of Bradford. My next transition is to be a student. Um, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that uh, Rupinda G becomes my supervisor because I would like to do my, um, my PhD at the University of Delhi, one of the most eminent universities in the world, because again, I'm proud of being um, somebody that's from the Indian diaspora. And what other way to, to showcase that proudness is to actually go to that university and celebrate that. Um, so that's what I'd like to do. And I think I'd also like to um, take my guidance from Rupinda on, in terms of how can we move on with uh, Let's Talk Business. It's a conversation that I'd like to have with Lord Ranger as well when we when I get that conversation, you know, at the House of Lords again. Getting into Lord Ranger's diary is just unbelievable. So well done, Rupinda, to get in here, you know, for, for an hour. Um, so these are the things that we're building on. So um, I'd like to hand back to Arman, who gave me a wonderful welcome. So Arman, thank you very much for allowing me to speak and again, Apologies to the audience. It was very quiet when I started here. I think they've all come here to see what we're doing. So apologies once again, and I'll now go on mute. Thank you so so much for that, ma'am. And again, this was this was very very comprehensive. You've given so much to us, and I think after you, know, it's just both of these sessions have been so complimentary. You've spoken about the sort of historical affinity which you feel, you know both of these cultures have, you know, India and the UK and how you feel so grounded and connected with your roots. And I think that's, that's, that's very beautiful. And, 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 and I think one of the reasons why we were able to relate to you is because of those links in, 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 in a way. And, you know, as a political science student, uh, you know, there were many things which struck me personally, and I think it would have struck a lot of the audience as well. You've spoken about how less than 8% of the population there being part of the Indian diaspora gives you more than 10% of the GDP. And I think that, that that helps me draw a link to this concept of what does, you know, Prime Minister Modi called living bridges, right? And a lot of, I, I know for a fact that a lot of the people who are watching this webinar, who are attending this webinar are very interested in policy. And, and a lot of them are aspirants for bureaucracy and UPSC and whatnot. So I think it's important for them to realize how business policy you know, you know, strategic multilateralism, all of these different things really come together and concatenate into that one phrase which you use, ma'am, and that is people. And that people, of course, forms the diaspora of the UK. And that's why I, I actually, coincidentally, I was just reading the, the newspaper. A few, I mean, I, I have a virtual background, you can't see it, but I was reading the newspaper a few hours back and it's, it's the Indian Express and it has 10 articles today itself which talk about how uh, you know, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is coming in. There is an FTA on the cards. There is, of course, a lot of other talks about multilateral relations on the cards. So I think it's very important for us as political science students to gauge how important diasporas are all over the world. And especially with reference to the UK, since we have two eminent guests from there, we, we've been given living examples of how those diaspora help 
not only us succeed but our, our our entire image as a nation you know we didn't we we were we were a post colonial country and uk uk was the colonial power but we never we never severed links with them we never jettisoned those links and ultimately uh, you know those those are what formed the anchor for a very fruitful relationship today so i i think that that just about sums up what i think a lot of people must be feeling we we're very very out of time so we'll only be able to take one question from the audience but i open the floor to the audience you can you can type your question in the chat box or you can you know you can just raise your hand or something so that i can unmute you and you can ask your question if there are any uh i i i'm sorry for intervening i really need to ask lord ranger if he has the time to uh address any questions yes i have few minutes <laughs> yeah. two minutes to be i personal. enjoyed i enjoyed uh Sharon's, you know, talk amazing, so comprehensive. She is so talented and so much to offer, and but keeps her profile very low. You have right. to raise your profile and raise the work you do. <laughs> right, uh, ma'am. So I think we do have a question on the chat. So yes, yeah, so this is again very interesting. This question comes in from. Uh, from from rajeshri pathak and she is a fellow student so she is asking what is the importance of the indian diaspora residing in the uk on the political front so yeah so she is asking as a political science student uh, any any of our guests who would like to take up that question you are more than welcome to do so shall i go first sure sir floor is yours that's a very very good question uh, you know i must give you are deeply respected in a country where you have decided to live and made a domicile you will not be respected if you remember it took jewish people one holocaust to realize that politics is a necessity not a choice they too were not interested in public life or political life they were too busy making money socializing they had big houses big car big weddings and everything like indians do and this is why we were kicked out of uganda if you remember because we have been victim of our own success so this is what we started 20 years ago when indians were not interested in public life or politics so we had to bring very strong message that your house will burn a fire brigade will not come your child will be attacked by racists and police will not come because you can't fool all the people all the time so therefore if you decide to make money i don't want to say that we do have a very good prime minister which i admire and a good team but on the whole there are lots of member of parliament with criminal record and with all the shady dealings and everything so they say for evil to flourish all it takes is for good people to do nothing so i will request you young people to get into public life politics and make your country proud of your life thank you thank you thank you so much for that sir i think that was that answer speaks for itself and uh, if sharan ma'am would like to take it up if you have anything to say on it i mean i would absolutely um, echo what uh, ramiji has said and in fact um under um, ramiji's um guidance i'm also <laughs> um changing my career path and going into politics myself because um i've um, absolutely realized also that if you want to be heard if you want to make change you have to have a seat around that table um so having a seat around that table isn't just your seat but you're representing your community so um i throw my hat in the ring um to get involved in local politics um and then i'll be furthering my career and learning very much from you'll be guiding me remiji will be guiding me on on how to do that um so the answer to the question it's absolutely paramount um it is really really important if you want to make impact if you want to see change you can only be heard if you've got a seat round the policy making table what's very good about the uk is if you have a look at the uk cabinet never have we had such a wonderful diverse cabinet if you have a look at the kind of people that are in there they do look like um the uk british asian there is great representation if you look at the house of lords i mean 
Lord Ramiji sitting there is very, very proactive. You know, that whole access, I mean, I talk about social capital. Social capital is something that's very, very powerful. And Lord Ramiji is one of a shining example of how he's, he doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't owe anybody anything. He's not related to me. I've never known him before, but he, not only for me, but he goes out of his way to use his political influence, his political collateral, his social collateral to give that hand up to, for people like me. My parents came into the UK with nothing. Their plan, their idea was their four children getting education because actually education, you know, is the real route um, to, to, um, to support it really gets you out of that poverty trap it really helps you nobody can take your education education has no class um, but social capital you're very lucky if you meet people who will give you that helping hand a lot of people they get there they make it then they shut the door behind them there are very unique gems who actually say do you know what i've made it and i've done it but i'm going to help other people so to answer the question, it's, it's yes. The more people that can enter politics, the more people that can understand politics, it's really, really important. So yeah, go for it. All of you go for it. Thank you so, so much uh, to both of our eminent guests. And I think the, we could only take up one question because we're out of time and it's a last very unfortunate. But uh, with that being said, um, I, I would like to thank both of our guests for taking out the time from their extremely busy schedules to be here with us. This was a very illuminating, very educational experience for all of us. And I think we're all better off. Um, so may I now invite the president of the organization, La Politique, Harsh Pansal, to provide a formal vote of thanks to both of our chief guests. Thank you, Arman. As we near the end of lecture, first of our Frank Thakudas Memorial Lecture Series, I am Ahash Banshal, President of La Politik. Would like to extend my special thanks to Lord Raminder Singh Ranger and Miss Salun Kaur, our Principal Ma'am Professor Vibha Singh Chauhan and Staff Advisor, Professor Ruminder Obroe and teachers. A big thanks to organizing committee and volunteer for organizing, arranging and everything. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh. Thank you, Armand. Thank you, Lord Ranger. And thank you, Sharon, for this very, very engaging conversation we had with our students. More to come in the future, I hope. It's always a value to hear you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs>